Okay, thank you. So in the uh, 20 minutes that we have, I'm gonna go over briefly some management considerations for the pregnant patient with IBD. So we'll talk about the general course of IBD in pregnancy and the importance of preconception counseling and care and what to do in a flare like in this patient uh, scenario uh, during pregnancy and then general medication safety and IBD and then postpartum considerations. So let's talk first about pregnancy and IBD disease course. So when we think about overall, when we compare a pregnant patient with uh, IBD versus age match controls without IBD, we do see higher rates of spontaneous abortion, preterm birth. We do see more adverse um, pregnancy complications in that in, in IBD patients. However, it's important to take into account that there are other factors that may account for this. And so it's really important that patients have, we have multidisciplinary attention that, um, that we give to our patients who are planning a pregnancy so we can avoid those types of outcomes. So we know that with greater disease activity during pregnancy, it's associated with higher risks of adverse events. So this is one study that suggests a Danish cohort study had 55% of mothers that had inactive disease and 45% of mothers that had moderate to high risk disease activity, that there's a twofold higher relative risk of preterm birth in women with low or a moderate um, high disease activity during pregnancy compared to women without any disease activity. So we, it's really important that we try to control that disease activity in pregnancy and actually at the time of conception. So we know that that IBD course is really going to be reflective of what happens at the time of conception. So this is a really nice European prospective multicenter study of 332 pregnant women. And in this study, they show that IB, if IBD is in remission at the time of conception, the likelihood that the patient will remain in remission Throughout the, throughout the duration of the pregnancy and in the postpartum period is quite high, roughly 86%. Now let's say that we have patients who are active at the time of, of conception, then there's a high risk for active disease or worsening disease, pregnant, uh, worsening disease during pregnancy, roughly 26 to 33% of ongoing activity. So these are things I usually like to tell my patients early on so they understand the importance of being in remission at the time of conception for good pregnancy outcomes. So this was also seen in another study from the Netherlands, 298 women, prospective cohort, and the outcome was disease relapse during pregnancy. So the adjusted odds ratio of having active disease, um, I'm sorry, of having disease relapse with active disease as conception is sevenfold higher risk. So it's really important to try to get that disease activity under control early. So this is where preconception counseling comes in. So this was a really nice study, I thought, that from the Netherlands where they randomized patients to preconception counseling versus no preconception counseling. And and this included talking about reducing risk behavior, getting the disease activity under control, nutritional optimization. And you can see that over time, the disease activity outcomes are so much better. They don't have as much disease activity during, preg uh, during uh, pregnancy. And then they're actually, it's protective for low birth weight uh, for patients who had preconception counseling. So this is an incredibly important part of our care of, our, of, of women who are considering family planning um, to have this preconception counseling. So actually, for all my... Uh, women patients who have childbearing age, I do briefly mention, even if they're not ready for family planning, I do say when you are ready for that time period, it's important that we have a discussion. You know, they sometimes don't think that, you know, an IBD doctor should be getting involved in this, but actually you want to let them know early on that it is important to get us involved so that we can make sure that disease activity is in remission and that we've optimized them as much as possible by the time that they're ready for family planning. So when should this happen? So this should happen at, at about six months before conception, and you want to optimize disease uh, control before pregnancy, and you really want to make sure that you've uh, assessed for objective evidence of disease control. So you want to make sure they have at least three months of steroid-free clinical remission. You obviously want to try to consider for endoscopic remission at that time as well. It's good to have baseline CRP, fecal calprotectin levels also to really know where they're at, kind of get that stamp of understanding where they are at that time before they're considering pregnancy. You want to optimize nutritional status, maintain folate supplementation, evaluate iron, vitamin B12 levels. Um, and it's important, this is a good time to consider interdisciplinary consultations with maternal fetal medicine. Um, and then healthcare maintenance is a good time as well for that. Pap smears, colon cancer surveillance, and in stopping any um, risk behavior, um, as well as uh, being up to date on vaccines. So what are some uh, medical management considerations in IBD? So if a patient's on methotrexate, you wanna make sure that they're off of methotrexate for at least three months prior to conception. They can continue mesalamines, they can continue azathioprine or 6MP, they continue their biologic therapies, but you wanna actually, I, I usually like to check a drug level. Um, there have been uh, patients in cases, I think I've talked to Dr. Macharla about one recently, where you know you want they can actually develop antibodies during pregnancy. You wanna make sure they're as optimized as possible prior, uh, prior to that time. 
time um, that they are pregnant. Um, you also want to taper off their corticosteroids if they're on them and make sure they're on a good, stable steroid sparing regimen for at least three months prior to uh, conception. Now, there's not enough data right now to uh, to advocate for using small molecules uh, in pregnancy. So with tofacitinib and upadacitinib, in animal studies, there have been some suggestions of, of uh, congenital malformations at higher doses of the drug. So at this point, we don't have enough data to really support the use of these small molecules in pregnancy. Um, so if we are considering patients, uh, if they're on this therapy, um, you wanna make sure that you um, probably stop it one month before conception. And same with ozanamod, there's some data suggestive of congenital malformations in animals animal studies, and, and because of the longer half-life, the thought process to actually hold it three months before conception. Um, so we're going to need more data. Now, this is a tricky, uh, tricky subject. So usually for patients who are not considering family planning yet, I do think about whether to consider tofacitinib or patacinib or ozanamod early on if they're of childbearing age. So I have other options to consider. I may consider other therapies um, before these small molecules, even if maybe medically these might be better options, because this is a tricky subject once they become ready for family planning, what to do about this, uh, what, about their therapies when they're ready for pregnancy. Okay, let's talk about care during pregnancy. So this really depends on if a patient is in remission at the time of pregnancy or if they have active disease. So if they're in remission, you can really follow them out once, maybe during first trimester, second trimester, check their labs at every trimester, and then uh, perform routine antepartum care, counseling on the mode of delivery, and also uh, measure third trimester fetal growth ultrasound. So if they're active, though, you want to see them every two weeks. You want to do everything you can to try to control that disease activity as soon as possible with as limited steroids as possible. You also want to make sure that you track fetal growth surveillance every four weeks after 24 weeks because they are at risk for, um, for low birth weight. Also, antepartum surveillance is very important in that third trimester, and you also want to make sure you're counseling them on delivery mode, modes and method and cervical ultrasound length screening at 18 to 22 weeks of gestation. If they're on steroids, you also want to do early glucose screening as well. So what to do in a flare? So if a patient is flaring, you want to make sure you get the lab. So in, in uh, Berkeley's case, this patient already has had some labs uh, done. You want to make sure you rule out any infections. So you can also perform stool microscopy. Now, um, can you consider imaging or endoscopic examination for patients that, um, that are in a flare? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the answer is for a, a sigmoidoscopy, unsedated, unprepped, it's OK to consider during all three uh, trimesters. So moderate to severe disease, you may be forced to consider a short a prednisone taper, but you want to make sure that you consider the shortest course possible to control the disease. Right now, there's limited data for budesonide, but still considered to be relatively safe in pregnancy. So what um, agents do we not start during a flare? So we don't start thiopurines, we don't start JAK inhibitors, and we don't start S1P1 modulators. But thiopurines, if they're already on it, it's okay to continue. Um, and uh, biologic therapy, if they're already on that, they can also continue. Now, uh, th therapies that can be started to help control the inflammation in patients include antibiotics, corticosteroids, again, shortest course possible, biologics if necessary, and if there's limited data for cyclosporin. So as mentioned earlier with sigmoidoscopy or pregnancy, so sigmoidoscopy can be considered without sedation and without preparation uh, throughout gestation. Now, full colonoscopy is a little more dicey, especially after 24 weeks. You should have a documented, documented discussion about fetal monitoring and possible need for emergency C-section, and, and they should be in the left lateral tilt position to avoid any compression of intra-abdominal vasculature. So imaging, especially in someone with Crohn's disease, um, you, MRI is typically preferred in pregnancy without gadolinium, but if you do need a CT scan, um, cumulative radiation exposure of a single CT is still considered below the level of concern. Now, intestinal ultrasound is a, an amazing uh, option, and I'm, I'm hoping this will catch on more, um, up to 20 weeks of gestation to help evaluate for small bowel stricturing, bowel wall thickness, and fistula tracts. So this is just for your reference. I'm going to kind of go over this quickly for medication therapies during pregnancy. So antidiarrheal therapy is probably not really great to use. Antibiotics, amoxicillin clavulanic acid is preferred. Um, there used to be contraindications for metronidazole, ciprofloxacin, but more recent data suggests that they're low risk. 
Corticosteroids um, probably can be used shortest, shortest course possible, though. Um, there are some adverse risks associated with corticosteroid uh, use during pregnancy. And aminosalicylates, um, if you use sulfasalazine, increase the folic acid to 2, mil two milligrams a day. And then uh, immunomodulators you want to use, um, do not use methotrexate during pregnancy. Thiopurines you want to avoid in initiation during pregnancy. And, and we talked about the small molecules that we don't want to be um, initiating these during pregnancy. So let's talk a little bit about neonatal and um, pregnancy outcomes. So this is the PIANO study. Um, so this is a prospective multi-center observational cohort study recently published in Gastro in 2021. And the primary analysis was looking at five outcome, uh, different outcomes among pregnancies um, that were exposed or unexposed to biologics, thiopurines, or combination therapy. So they looked at 1,490 pregnancies and then 1,431 live births. And um, they've, uh, 379 patients were not on treatment. Um, 242 were on thiopurine, 642 on biologics, and 227 on combination therapy. And what you see here is that there's no increase in congenital malformations, spontaneous abortions, preterm birth or low birth weight with these treatments. You do see with increased disease activity, as I mentioned earlier, there are adverse uh, events. So there was increased risk of spontaneous abortion with uh, increased disease activity noted. And when they looked at developmental milestones, uh, the babies did great, no negative impact of drug exposure. Now, infection risk did increase if, uh, if patients had increased uh, with preterm birth. So that's something to keep in mind. So I wanted to draw extra attention to the infection risk and biologic thiopurine use. So um, when you control for preterm birth, maternal age, and disease activity, there was no increase in serious, non-serious, or any infection in that first year of life. So this is super important because in the past, there was always this thought process that we'd have to hold the biologic therapy in that third trimester. But these data support that you don't really need to be doing that. Um, you don't need to be withholding biological therapy in pregnant IBD patients during the three trimesters. So I wanted to bring a little bit of extra attention to the corticosteroid use in pregnancy. This was an interesting study in gut of 2022, where they looked at steroid exposure on adverse pregnancy outcomes in the offspring of mothers with IBD in this piano cohort. And it was associated with higher risk of preterm birth, NICU admissions, low birth weight, and late corticosteroid use was associated with serious infections at nine and 12 months. So really what this comes out, there was also a few extra cases of, uh, of cleft palate that were noted in the corticosteroid exposed versus non-exposed. The numbers are very small, but there was a little bit of a higher a number of these uh, uh, noted. So what really the upshot of all this is that controlling disease activity before and during pregnancy is incredibly important. These outcomes could be more of a reflection of active disease during pregnancy. Nevertheless, um, it's something that we, we want to limit that steroid exposure as much as possible. So what about vetalizumab and ustekinumab? Basically, animal studies did not show any adverse effects on pre- or postnatal development with these two agents, and post-marketing marketing studies show no new safety concerns for both agents. And there are small studies to date that suggest that the risks of using uh, vetalizumab or ustekinumab in pregnancy over anti-TNF, that the, uh, the pregnancy outcomes are comparable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about delivery plans. So most patients are eligible to consider vaginal delivery, but if you do have active perianal disease, there could be a tenfold increased risk of fourth degree lacerations with vaginal delivery. So patients with uh, rectovaginal fistulas, you also do not want to consider vaginal delivery. And with the pouch as well, it would, they would probably benefit more from a C-section to prevent anal uh, sphincter injury or the risk of incontinence. And then for uh, patients who've had a C-section, that we also should be thinking about venous thromboembolism profile axis in those patients as well, mechanical as well as pharmacological. Okay, to wrap things up, I'll talk a little about postpartum considerations. So vaccinations for the baby, um, all vaccines should be given on, on schedule. So live vaccines in the first six months with in utero biologic exposure may be avoided. So that really only applies to rotavirus. And live vaccines at one year, though, can be given in breastfeeding infants um, of mothers on biological therapy. And then when it comes to lactation, really the only therapies that we have to limit would be methotrexate say tofacidinib, upadnesib, and or ozanamod. And for mesalamines, it, um, they are preferred over sulfasalazine since there's a small risk of hemolysis that have been associated with sulfasalazine. Thiopurines can be continued, no need to pump and dump. There was some thought that that was necessary in the past. And usually biologics are thought to have passed at low concentrations to the baby, so there's no adverse consequences to infant health outcomes. So in conclusion, 
preconception counseling, if you take one thing uh, away from this, it's the most important. It's most important uh, for optimal pregnancy outcomes to have the re have remission at the time of conception, and patients should continue the IBD medications to maintain disease remission. And there needs to be a coordinated message between your obstetrician as well as the gastroenterologist for um, for good uh, pregnancy outcomes. I think, and we want to make sure we avoid newer small molecules in pregnancy until we have uh, further data available. Thank you. Thank you.